So moving right along, and, and by the way, guys, around 2.30 today, we're going to bring all of the project leads up, and they're going to talk about sort of the plenaries about how their, their sessions have, have been going. You see, you know, the room's a little dispersed. Uh, we've got tons of people down in the actual project rooms working technically on, on the projects that make this community happen. So uh, come back, listen to the plenary, listen to the project leads and what they've been talking about, because this is going to set the pace for the next six months, the next year of what we're going to go work on. Uh, our next speaker, I'm going to bring up a panel, but first I want to introduce you to, to John Kumi, who is a research fellow at Stanford University, and we're going to talk a little more about data centers. So please help me welcome John Kumi. So we have uh, a distinguished panel for you today. You can read the bios in the program. Uh, because time is short, we're not going to take questions. We only have 20 minutes. Uh, but we have uh, on the panel Jim Stogdill at O'Reilly. Uh, Kushagra Ved of Microsoft, and uh, Sherman Ikemoto of Future Facilities. We're going to talk about the great irony that information technology has been a driver for efficiency improvements throughout the economy, but by and large has not affected the way IT itself is provisioned, and particularly we're talking about enterprise IT. There's massive inefficiencies. We all know the stories about uh, you know, 10 to 30 percent of the servers being comatose. We know about low utilization. We know about uh, lack of transparency of the total cost of IT at the project level or the business unit level. And we have a panel that can address at various levels some of the, the issues around fixing those problems. So I'm going to start with Jim. He has experience in the open source uh, software area. And Jim, I wanted to ask what lessons are there from the open source community, the open source software community for kind of transforming IT to become more efficient inside the enterprise? Um, I actually think it's, a, it's almost a misdirected question in the sense that we focus a lot on the openness, which is an enabler for a lot of things. But ultimately, the question is about um, how do we keep the hurdle low to adopt new things. And in the open source software space, it was really about uh, low hurdle for adoption. Um, it was about low cost. I could try before I buy. I could get things inside the data center and use them before we even sort of realized that we were using them. And also the low exit, you know, in terms of no proprietary lock-in. So it's really about getting the stuff in. And in fact, in the open hardware space, or at least in the um, horizontal compute space, probably the most interesting thing right now is being able to enter your credit card and get an EC2 instance. That's probably the thing that's the most parallel um, to what we're talking about here. So from an open compute perspective, the question is really, how do we lower the hurdles across the board? Not just with open source and open culture, but other models that really make it easier to adopt these things. OK, so it sounds like it's, it's not just a hardware problem. Even in open compute, it's also no, a software. No, not even close. And the, it, we have to be careful not to sort of overstate the parallels between open source. I mean, open software, after all, I can download and try it and you know, zero friction. Uh, hardware, at the end of the day, I still have to have it show up in the crate and do something with it um, if I'm really going to try it on premise. Um, so really, we should be asking ourselves what models can make that process be as simple as possible. So Kushagra, Microsoft has been really driving forward with large-scale integration. If you could talk a little bit about some of the challenges and, and benefits you've encountered as part of that process, we'd love to hear it. Yeah, thanks, John. That's a great question. So in the in the early days, uh, as Microsoft was scaling uh, its uh, data centers, uh, we realized that uh, unless there was uh, some kind of a standardization uh, process where we could have uh, consistency across the different life stages of the design, supply chain, and operations, it would really be difficult to ensure that we meet our time to market goals, uh, to meet our efficiency goals and also to keep costs under control. So, so at a high level, I guess we break it down into those three areas. So for the design front, uh, the, the key principles are uh, having modularity, because the facility has a typically a 15-year life. Uh, technologies change, and it should be easy to introduce new technologies over the life cycle. Uh, and this applies to things like thermal design, mechanical design, you know, power electrical design, you know, uh, the control software, EPMS, DCIM, all that, right? On the supply chain side, uh, how the servers get deployed from uh, the dock to the time they go live, you know, hooking up the power connectors, rolling them, rolling the racks in. So there needs to be a, a sort of a, a very streamlined process to take care of that. 
On the operation side, essentially, you know, you can't fix what you can't monitor. So it's very important to have all kinds of monitoring, uh, power monitoring, performance monitoring, you know, um, just uh, utilization metrics, and feed that into a machine learning system which can detect patterns for you and find out when you're operating below efficiency levels. Okay, so what about, you talked about measurements, but what about metrics, particularly links back to business performance? Are you doing anything internal? I know eBay has been doing that with its DSE metric. Is there anything comparable inside Microsoft to drive better business behavior, more profitable business behavior? Right, so there's different metrics at different uh, stages of the life cycle. So during the design, power efficiency metrics and uh, agility metrics are typically um, prevalent. During the deployment phase, how long it takes for a server to go live, which is a critical path in getting the service off and running is, is critical. During the operations piece, the metrics are typically how efficiently are you running. PUE is sort of one level of indication, but there's like a several you know, low-level metrics below it to monitor at the run circuit level and even at the server level. What about transactions? Any measurement of cost per transaction or energy use per transaction or profits per transaction, this kind of thing? Yeah, we do typically do that on a per application basis. Uh, so for example, for uh, running uh, web search, uh, there'll be a metric that will take into account the cost of running a web search based on the facility metrics. Mm -hmm. For running Windows Azure, there'll be a metric for what's the cost of hosting a VM based on, so there's metrics for every kind of application. And so do the programmers get feedback? If they're designing Absolutely. inefficient code, do they get yeah. a memo on their desk saying, yeah, do, well, do better? Yeah, they probably don't get a <laughs> memo on their desk. An email, whatever. Yeah, but it, it feeds into this uh, design cycle where uh, as we learn you know, where the efficient inefficiencies are, then we can kind of factor that into improving our software or improving the next facility that's going to be built. And it's a continuous cycle where you drive that improvement going forward. OK. So Sherman, let me turn to you. So uh, you know a lot about existing facilities and how apparently logical decisions can lead to, in, in terms of IT deployment, can lead to stranded capacity inside existing enterprise facilities. Can you talk a little bit about how software can mitigate those kinds of issues? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, my, my background, my expertise is more on the physical side of the data center and getting full utilization of the physical capacity of the room, whether you're talking about space or the power that's being provided or the, the cooling provision to the data center. And um, so uh, there are emerging standards now that will help various silos of the data center management teams manage their own portion of the data center. Um, and uh, there's software-based uh, standards, there's measurement-based standards like PUE. Um, but the challenge is to start to integrate all of these various strands or silos of management into a single overarching uh, metric and way of, of, of visualizing how well the data center itself is performing as a system. So that's, that's the challenge. And there is software available to do that now. Um, it's one level higher than where the industry is today. And it will involve a new software technology, which is modeling. It has to be modeled because the various uh, subcomponents of the data center, need, you need to know how they interact with each other at a system level, and that involves modeling. Okay, so can you give an, a, an example from one of your clients? You don't have to name a client. But. Yeah, okay. So um, we, we do have a client uh, in the UK that's been using this software that we're describing for about two years now. They started off with um, monitoring and tracking the, like I said, the individual silos, facilities, IT performance, and how they're, they're performing individually. And we, in, we brought in software that, were, that was able to consolidate that data, so you can see it all in one view, number one. But then also input that into a, a model so that they can predict how the data center as a system is working uh, as a whole. And what they were able to do is they were able to simultaneously improve PUE and IT capacity of the data center uh, in a synchronized way. So it wasn't one group fighting the other. It was, it was the, the two groups working together. And they were able to achieve uh, a, a much lower PUE. They, uh, on 20,000 square feet, they were saving about a million and a half a year on the energy bill, which 
the uh, facilities team was happy about. On the IT side, they were able to free up um, the equivalent of about uh, 77 out of uh, 300 cabinets of computing re uh, resources. So both were achieved at the same time, and the only way they were able to do it is to see how the two subsystems interacted with each other in a model. Okay, so you do you make a computer model of the facility, and then you model any potential changes in the IT deployment to see what will happen using CSD model. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we have this, this issue that IT deployments almost always are different than what the data center has planned for, right? It's designed for a certain kind of IT, and we all know IT changes very rapidly. So what kind of developments would make tracking that sort of, and I'm asking this for the whole panel, what kind of developments would, would make tracking the rapid change of IT easier and more effective in order to, to keep up with the, the rate of change? Well, I, I still think the question you asked is one of the most interesting ones, which is that uh, how do we define workload? I mean, the way we talk about data centers, it often seems like data centers are the place where we dispose of excess electricity. You know, we talk about them in terms of megawatts, you know, used instead of um, what we're actually able to, to do with it. We don't have, and because, especially in the enterprise space where the workloads are so diverse, it's really difficult to come up with a common definition of what a workload even is. But to the degree that we can talk in terms of work, unit workload per unit cost, um, it's much easier to make the kinds of decisions that support adoption of technologies that reduce cost. Right, and so this brings up a really important point, which is that the workloads relate to business value, yeah. right? What does it do for the company to generate this much computing? The problem is that the decisions made inside the different silos that, that Sherman mentioned, those they don't have control over the workloads, right. usually. Like the facilities folks have no control over what workloads are run, and maybe even the IT folks don't have much control right. because it's, it's kind of there's kind of a, There's a hierarchy, right, from PUE to utilization to actually what's happening in that utilized code to the application layer. And because we can measure it, we focus on PUE, even long after each incremental dollar is probably not giving us much return, and we could much better spend it further up that hierarchy. Right. But That's it's difficult cool. to know. Kishagri, I think there's uh, several levels of uh, improvements and efficiency. So uh, having visibility into the workload and the facility and everything in the middle is, of course, beneficial. But even if, uh, even if uh, you, know, you start with some areas and start to optimize those areas, that's also going to give significant benefits. Like the example that Sherman mentioned where uh, uh, this customer was able to take all the data and model it and find out areas of efficiency and go change the design. You know, I, I don't know how many people do that in real life. And there's probably some people who realize that there is gains to be had. And uh, you know, I think the problem there is uh, this lack of standardized interfaces, for one thing. So you know, if you get software solutions from multiple vendors, IT equipment from different vendors, and uh, a data center that was built to different standards, then all these interfaces start to break down, and there is no consistency anymore. Uh, so that's sort of a, and for the big data center providers in like Microsoft and uh, other cloud providers, uh, most of the software is written in-house, so we can sort of solve that problem. But for a traditional IT enterprise, it's very hard to do this in the absence of any standards um, and, uh, and some, some kind of a forum where the, the different components of the industry can come together and you know, define how these innovations should operate. Okay, so this, the standardization represented by OCP, for example, can help that process. Absolutely. What about modularity in the facility itself? All of you have mentioned something about that. Let's, let's talk about how that might help deal with the kind of problems that we've talked about. Yeah, it, from a physical standpoint, it reduces the number of degrees of freedom. And the less freedom you have, the, the more uh, able you are to meet your, your original goals. And it's easier to define the goals for a, a smaller module than it is for a, you know, a, a completely open data center, for example. So that, from a physical standpoint, it, it, it's very helpful. It doesn't get rid of the problem, because there, you still have to build out a module. And, and unless you stick to the original plan for that module, you're, you're going to run into capacity issues and shortfalls, or cost overruns is the other side of that coin. Um, but it does, it would mitigate it to an extent. Well, there's also an optimization thing that happens, which, uh, you know, if you're at web scale, you see you can optimize across a greater number of things. 
And even if you're not at web scale, the bigger you can sort of define the modules you're operating at, the more you can optimize. But that optimization depends on software. And I think one of the sort of provocative things that uh, open compute has to decide is whether or not it's an open hardware only thing or whether ultimately um, it embraces being about op open software as well. I mean, you essentially start off asking me if there's a parallel between open software and open hardware. And I think the actual answer to the question is that um, open hardware depends on open software to make any sense. And I don't mean at the layer of the operating system in this conversation. I mean at the layer of provisioning and dispatch and all the other stuff that makes this stuff work so that you can define an optimized module bigger than a single node. Sure. Um, just one last quick thing on that. Um, the stuff that was sort of innovated here for web scale that assumes a few workloads at wide, broad distribution will require different software at those layers to work well with an enterprise that is probably lots of diverse workloads across a smaller subset of, mo of nodes to function. So that place where the software controls all that stuff needs to be pretty flexible and open. And I think ultimately open compute will probably have to take that on or figure out a way to sort of uh, handle that. Because right, the whole stack matters here. Yeah. From, the, from the perspective of cost per unit of compute, you need to worry about software. You need to worry about how the it's, user is interacting. It's, it's from software. mortar all the way up to, yeah, all the way to the application stack. Yep. Yeah. And as far as uh, modularity goes, uh, one thing that has worked uh, pretty well for Microsoft, so um, there's a lot of data centers we have built that are so-called container-based, although they're not exactly ISO shipping containers, but they are of that form. But uh, what that helps with is, uh, because it's a fixed physical volume, there's a certain number of racks that go in, the power, amount, the power delivered is a fixed number, and it helps you to start to optimize parameters like delta T and what's the cooling capacity, how do you maximize your transactions per watt, and then you can start replicating that across uh, a broader footprint. Now, it doesn't necessarily need to be a container. It, the key concept here is to have a modular unit of containment. So if you have a co-location-based design and you have a modular unit, call it 15, 20 racks, that is a unit of containment, and you define these standards for, here's my interface for this contained unit, and I'll get this kind of power in, I'll monitor these kind of metrics, and internally, that helps to abstract away some of the problem and make things simpler. Okay, so it doesn't have to be physically contained. It can be contained, well, physically in the sense of a building right. or, or a, uh, a uh, shipping container, but it can be contained yeah, in, it can, in the airflow exactly. sense. A lot of, lot of folks sort of confuse uh, efficiency with containers. There's a big, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, containers help with that. But it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. But you can achieve a similar goal without actual physical containers. Exactly, yeah. And another thing that occurs to me about uh, these containers or, or related techniques that you're alluding to is that there are economies of scale. So that if you can build a lot of the same container, right. you can actually start to learn what the constraints are, what the, what the potential changes are. Uh, that could affect your operations. And, and you can't really do that when every data center is unique, which is pretty much true well, of most enterprise facilities. Uh, unconstrained, you'll, regardless of whether it's an open source like adoption model or not, you ultimately end up at the low energy state, right? And if it is a highly scalable system, the, high, the, the low energy state is probably going to be you not in your own data center. Right? Ultimately, it probably will be a utility for a lot of people. And I know a lot of people right now say, we're never going to do that, we're server huggers till the day we die. Um, and some people will stay that way, but even the DoD worked with Amazon to build a, a data center just for them. So I mean, it, but it still, it still takes advantage of the scale without necessarily, um, in, without necessarily giving up the controls. Right, and usually they're not taking legacy workloads to do that. Right. They're building new workloads that yeah. now can take advantage of the. Yeah, and if the, the earlier earlier conversation there was a discussion about how we're going to do things in the future when computing's cheaper that we don't do now, and in that context, the stuff that we do now that seems so big will be small just in relative size. It might not get any smaller, it might still be getting bigger, but relative to the things we're doing with IT in a digital business future, they'll seem minor. They'll be the back office stuff or whatever. Okay. Yeah. W one last thing I thought should be mentioned is that there, right now there isn't a good connection between, I think you mentioned this at the very beginning, business outcome uh, versus operations. Yeah, the connection between the two, I, I, as I understand, open compute is going a long way towards, towards making that connection. But in the enterprise, government, colo, 
the traditional mixed use mission critical data center, that connection is broken at the very beginning. The, the original plan is set, the money, uh, the money is committed to by the company, and then the plan is forgotten and everything goes to operations and pro uh, costs skyrocket, cost per compute skyrocket, and nobody really even knows about it. Mm -hmm. Right, so, so this points out the importance of senior management attention on these issues, which is almost, I wouldn't say entirely absent, but is often absent. And that's one of the things I think will need to change. The level of waste that we're talking about here is so large that uh, we will see massive shifts in the way enterprise IT is provisioned. There's, there's no other alternative. So we're now out of time. Uh, the panelists will stick around outside the hall to talk to anyone who wants to chat and we thank you all for your attention. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thanks, guys. All right. So that was an interesting talk, and uh, you know, being as transparent as I can be on the Foundation's behalf, you saw Frank's keynote yesterday talking about a, a, a new uh, licensing model. We're doing a lot to figure out how you get open source software and open source hardware working together. We think the license that we've come up with is, uh, is pretty interesting. So uh, we actually have some software contributions that have been given to us. Obviously, the Microsoft contribution um, that was just released yesterday. Uh, Cumulus Networks obviously has, has, has donated only to the foundation. So we do value software, and it is absolutely critical to a completely open source data center.